sometimes. How's everyone doing? Um, so uh, I've been I've been doing this for a while, um, and I, I just kind of wanted to give a quick presentation talking about like how I've done vulnerability management in the past, how it's failed miserably, and how I'm trying to do it this time, and I think it's working. And so that's kind of what what we're doing today. Uh, is this is like 60% story time with Nick, 40% like what's going on. Um, so uh, ego slide. Um, so my name is Nick Lehorn. I'm the CISO for Bluecore. We're a, a company we partner with uh, a retail industry. Uh, we help them identify who's actually on their website, what their shoppers are, uh, track their behavior, and then use some predictive analytics to figure out like what they're likely to buy next. Send them, you know, uh, 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 targeted uh, advertisements, emails, that kind of stuff. So really cool. Uh, before that, I was the director of application security for the New York Times. Uh, I worked for Indeed for a while as they're uh, building their GRC program. Um, I've worked I've worked for Rackspace, I've worked for Mitel, I've worked for a whole bunch of companies here in Austin uh, doing this kind of stuff. So um, starting off, what is a risk management program? So, or a vulnerability management program, rather. Uh, so the, the core concept, right, is you've got um, a whole bunch of stuff that you're getting feeds from. Risk assessments, vendor patches, CESS stuff coming in. Um, and the goal is, at the end of it, you want some kind of digestive process that you can give people a ordered list of things that they need to fix and a timeline of when they need to fix it by. Right, that's the concept. Um, which sounds super easy on paper, but then when you start doing it with people, it gets really, really hard. So, uh, how I've tried to do this in the past, it hasn't really worked well, um, and some glimmers of hope, right? So the first version of this uh, is uh, you just don't do it, right? This is the easiest way of going about it, uh, is <clears throat> you, you just use the chaos model of vulnerability management. So rather than actually like taking a, a structured approach to things, you kind of leave teams to their own devices and let them figure things out. Uh, there's not really any oversight from management. There's not a whole lot of product, there's not a whole lot of prioritization. Um, product always wins in these kind of situations because at the end of the day, the, the prioritization of things that the teams are working on is driven by the people with the loudest voices. And the people with the loudest voices are the people who are paying the bills. And that tends to be marketing, product, product engineering, those kind of folks. Um, and so there's a perverse incentive here where rather than spending time fixing vulnerabilities that are eventually potentially gonna lead to the downfall of the company and them losing their jobs, the pr uh, preferred thing is to work on fixing uh, features, shipping things out the door. Um, you, at this point, get a lot of squabbles over infrastructure. Like if people are responsible for patching their own stuff, then there's going to be that inevitable conversation of who owns the DNS server that's sitting in the basement that no one's touched in three years. Because uh, everyone uses it, but no one actually wants to do anything with it because that takes time and effort. And if no one owns it, no one has to do anything. So you've got a lot of orphaned infrastructure. Um, in terms of like compliance, this is the nightmare scenario. This is where you don't have anyone looking at any of this stuff. You assume that these things are happening, <clears throat> that someone's looking at this stuff, that they're responsible for something, but no one is. Uh, and there's no way to prove it. And you're going to get hacked. Like that's just, it's going to happen. <clears throat> so this is like for most organizations, um, before the age of like uh, everyone is a tech company, this was fine, right? You put out, you push out patches, you assume people are doing things, you update stuff every so often. Um, but with everything being connected, with everything being uh, in data centers, people relying on different services, like it becomes untenable. Um, and, and so then the, the next question, the next uh, step, right, is if you're not just relying on the engineers to do things, if you're actually trying to do this as a program and trying to push things, the next logical thought is, okay, so I need some policy that says you need to fix these things and update them by some time. And so we'll use CVSS because everyone has CVSS as their scoring system. That's what comes out in your patches and all that good stuff. 
And so this is the lazily overcorrecting vulnerability management program. So instead of you do whatever you want, Wild West, now we've got very strict thou shalts of you must implement, you must patch, you must fix, where compliance is super happy. Director of GRC is happy as a clam that you've actually got patches in flight. You're telling people what their requirements are. You're setting hard deadlines. You're being a, a boss about getting your patches done. But this is the overcorrection. Product slows to a halt. Now, at this point, you can't ship anything because all of your time is being spent taking up patching every single thing that comes out. Uh, if you've got uh, uh, open SSH vulnerability on a web server in the closet that no one ever actually touches that isn't connected to the internet, you're patching that versus shipping new product. So product development slows to a halt. Teams are punished for using new tech, uh, which is an interesting uh, thing that happens here because new tech uh, is super cool, but patches happen very quickly for stuff that's new. If you've got uh, a CentOS server sitting in the corner that's on CentOS 5, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of new patches coming out for it, uh, for better or worse, so you don't have to patch it. Versus if you've got the latest and greatest, patches are going to come out every day. Everyone's using it. Brand new stuff is happening, which is good. But now your time is spent patching versus doing other stuff. So it does reduce risk. In this scenario, you are patching things, you're fixing vulnerabilities, you're plugging holes, but it's inefficient. It's not allowing the business to actually thrive and grow. And the phrase I like, I think it's the phrase that got me my current job, is I can't secure a bankrupt business. The business has to operate, it has to flow, it has to make money in order for us to keep our jobs and keep working. Uh, and so if you've got so strict a vulnerability management program, that you can't actually push things out the door, you don't have a business anymore. And so this, this has to be a, a give and take between us, security folks, and the business. So uh, this also has the slight wrinkle of, OK, this makes sense for you know patches that you get, for pen test results that you get back, probably have CVSS associated with it. Um, vulnerability scanners that you have probably have CVSS associated with it. But what about? bug bounty finds, what about in-house things that you've found, uh, those kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, then you start getting into squabbles around, you know, is this actually 9.1 or is this a 7.5 or, or where is this on, this, on the rating scale? Uh, and, and that becomes a, uh, a problem. How do you rate it with everything else? So at this point, usually, or the way I've seen it, is uh, now you've overcorrected. And so now management is very annoyed at you that you slowed down production and wants them to do stuff. And so their question is, OK, how many of these vulnerabilities do we actually need to go after? And so the way that managers fix that problem is by managing poorly. Uh, and so they put meetings in place. And so the next logical step is, OK, we've got all these CVSS scores. We have all these vulnerabilities. Let's sit down and talk about them with the smartest people in the room and figure out how we're going to prioritize this, right? Because we have to do something about vulnerabilities, but we can't have the current situation. So the good news is that engineers can work on stuff again, but managers are desperately looking for the window to jump out of. This is the most painful meetings you've ever been in your life. Uh, I don't know if AJ is in the room, but I, we worked together at a place where this was happening. And it was uh, every two weeks was just uh, the dreaded meeting that we all saw and wanted to push off. Um, the other problem with this is that not every leader is technical enough to understand what's going on. Um, so when you've got these kind of situations, like if you have a bunch of smart people in the room, this could theoretically work, right? You could theoretically make a situation where a bunch of people get all the vulnerabilities in, sit down and prioritize it, put it into sprints, plan it out. But then you've got that one manager who doesn't really understand what SSH is or doesn't understand what a port does or doesn't get it. And that's what's going to keep you from having a good buy-in with any of this, is that they're just not going to understand it. Uh, and uh, the other issue that you bring up with this is, OK, now you've got a two-week 
cadence for these meetings. So every two weeks you have the meeting and then you prioritize and then that goes into sprints and then that gets set up. But what happens when you've got log4j that comes out and you need tomorrow to implement a patch? How does that get prioritized in with the rest of the work? How do you do the emergency planning around that? How do you set expectations around that when you don't have your, your meeting? And so either you pull in all the managers and get them very annoyed, or it just doesn't get patched, which is even worse. So this doesn't really work. So you need some method to, uh, to do this quickly. You need technical people looking at it. You need this done on a regular basis, on a regular cadence. Uh, and the answer seems to be, for most people, shift left, right? Left. Um, so we, we, instead of putting it in the manager's hands, because the managers are pissed off, now we put it in the engineer's hands. We give them tools and we help them try to understand what the vulnerabilities are and what the ratings are. But it really boils down to just part one with expensive tech, right? Uh, shift left seems to be code word for me for managers don't want to deal with it, so make the engineers do it, right? Uh, just overloading the engineers. So once again, engineers and their teams are responsible for the vulnerabilities in their areas. So we're back to part one, where you've got teams responsible for their own stuff, which in theory is fine. Like there's an alignment of power and responsibility there. Uh, if you push bad code, you should be responsible for it. That makes sense. But uh, it, in this kind of situation, uh, the problem that arises primarily is, once again, uh, the perverse incentive is there, right? You've got product trying to push stuff. You have uh, shipping deliverables that you need to get out the door. You, you need to make the business run, and you're now bogging down the engineers with all these vulnerabilities that now lack the context that they used to have when you had the larger meetings. So you don't understand, is this specific vulnerability a problem? Is this something I need to fix today versus tomorrow? All of it is flattened back down to CVSS, just shifted so they don't get the larger understanding of what's going on. It's back to a disorganized mess. There's no way to reliably resolve emergency threats because each team is now responsible for their own vulnerabilities, means they each have a different way of handling them. If you're surfacing, say you, you give everyone access to Sneak, right? Sneak is the uh, static application security testing tool, uh, checks your code, see if there's anything there. You give them access to it and say, cool, everything high and above, fix immediately, go. What if something new comes out and you need to push that to all of your teams immediately? Maybe Sneak doesn't have it yet. Maybe there's something else that's happening. Um, it's hard to get into each and every one of their planning cycles and have them fix it because they've each figured out a different way to categorize it. Maybe one team's in JIRA doing their stuff. Maybe another team's just in sneak natively uh, taking care of those things. How do you influence every single one and make sure they're doing it right is tough. You've got some good tooling though, right? This is, uh, this is where we're better than we were in part one a little bit is that the tooling's a lot better. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Orca and Wiz, uh, who have done a fantastic job of trying to contextualize vulnerabilities. So rather than just saying this is a CVSS of, of 9.8, it understands the context of like, okay, is this a bucket that actually has read access? Is this a publicly facing server? Is this something I actually care about? Um, and does a good job of reprioritizing that a little bit so you don't have the same... Um, necessarily the same like non-understanding of context you had before. Um, but the problem now is you've got different tools doing the same things. You've got different vulnerabilities in different places. Uh, and it's a bit of a mess. So it's inconsistent. <clears throat> so uh, I uh, have tried this a couple different ways. And it usually doesn't come out great. It's come out better each time. Um, and so I want to talk today about like how I've taken the approach of trying to flatten this a little bit and make it a little bit clearer for teams to understand, um, be able to add in vulnerabilities from other locations and give them a clear understanding of kind of like what their prioritization is, uh, allow us to do that in real time, um, while still giving them the option to do this kind of in a sprint manner. Like so, uh, 
critical stuff will get fixed, but they can still sprint plan most of it. So this, this is kind of how I'm doing it now, is instead of just one big chart, one big set of requirements, I'm trying to break it down a little bit um, and, and make it a little bit better chunked, a little bit more flow. I don't know what to call this yet, but it's three things, right? So step one, and this is the part that the auditors like, is set default expectations. So by default, you know, in a perfect world, in a, uh, a flat frictionless plane with no air resistance, right? In theory, resolve all vulnerabilities in 90 days, resolve security things in 30 days, resolve critical stuff in seven days. Auditors love that there's a timeline associated. There's clear and obvious things. Now that we have tooling to track a lot of this stuff, we can see you know, where the exceptions are and poke people about it. Like that's a good starting point, but no one's gonna actually be able to do this. Like there is no way that uh, a team is gonna be able, able to update the underlying Kubernetes cluster uh, software in seven days every time something comes out. There's always gonna be something uh, that's gonna prevent them from doing that. So that's where we get to the complicated part. So this is uh, the, the fun bit uh, that I've been, I've been coming up with and tinkering with. So in a situation where you can't do option one, you can't do the default expectations, so let's talk about uh, how it actually matters to the business and is this actually something we need to patch quickly? Reset expectations. So this is where we're actually taking a risk-based approach uh, specific to the business itself, not necessarily the vulnerability. So uh, there's, there's two broad things we're doing. Question number one is, if this were to happen, if this vulnerability were to be exploited in its current context, how bad would it be, right? And so that's uh, impact over on the left. So impact level one is generally stuff that I would say is uh, we close the shop, like existential crisis. Um, like these are things that would be uh, uh, front page of the New York Times, like bad stuff. So uh, in, in creating this for your own organizations, this is the category where I would sit down and think, okay, keys to my kingdom are X, Y, and Z. These kinds of vulnerabilities would lead to that kind of stuff being, being uh, 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 compromised. Uh, so that's bad. Impact level two would be, eh, it's bad, it opens the door for something uh, further. Uh, this would be like chained attacks, um, things where like it may not be the initial vulnerability, but it could be chained as a larger part of a vulnerability, um, something that's a little bit less uh, concerning. And then level three is just anything else. So that's how bad could it be? Uh, and then all across the top is uh, how likely is this to actually happen? So in our organization, sit down and think about it for a second. Um, this specific vulnerability, how likely is it to, or, or what are the set of circumstances around it that make it uh, more or less likely to be exploited? So uh, if it's something that could be anonymous over the internet, if I can just go to the website and get to this immediately, like that's a level one versus uh, level four would be like, it's in the closet. I'd have to go put a USB drive in it and, and do something to it. Right. So, so what we've done is we've set objective definitions for the different levels of these different things. We've cross mapped them uh, to define risk. So based on uh, its uh, likelihood and impact, right? It's risk is just likelihood and impact. We've set clear definitions for those that are objective relatively. Um, and then we can define the risk. So now that we have the risk, we can reset some expectations. Cool. So you couldn't do that in seven days. We've determined that, you know, that's right. Uh, the vulnerability you're talking about, it actually codes out as a medium. Uh, you know what? Schedule it in a reasonable period of time. We'll figure it out, right? We're now setting, instead of the default, we're setting uh, a little bit longer timeline. We're giving you a little bit more time, um, mainly because this is something that now we've gone through the process of figuring out, okay, for us in our environment, not just in a vacuum, but for our specific environment, this poses less of a risk. Therefore, you're okay to give it a little bit more time and we'll follow up. Uh, two things that are really cool here. Um, first, 
this replaces CVSS on vulnerability assessments, uh, on um, penetration testing reports. Like you can, uh, it, slight little hack for CISOs and other folks, like you can replace your stated risk score with these, uh, which gives you more time for remediation and things like that. Um, typically auditors are looking for making sure that you have some assertion of risk level or some assertion of criticality. You don't have to accept the pen tester's assertion of criticality. You can insert your own and give yourself more time, which is cool. Uh, especially because like now you've actually given yourself thought process of going through it and figuring out does this matter to us versus pen testers generally look at it in that vacuum. Also gives your teams more time. So now you have a different set of stated, uh, uh, stated timelines that they're working to. You can still track and figure out, OK, are they going to the right levels? Are they meeting these expectations? Because that brings us to step three. OK, if you didn't meet those expectations, you didn't patch it within the default set, we went through the risk assessment process, came out with a different set, still couldn't meet that, let's talk about, from a business perspective, what the risk is. And now this becomes a business decision. This is no longer us, right? Um, I view the job of the security team uh, as uh, we are here to inform the risk decision. We're not here necessarily to actually reduce risk to the business. We're here to make sure the business understands their risk and helps them reduce it, right? So. We've set expectations, we've set our opinion for things, and now the business is saying, we can't meet those, so let's talk about it. So things to consider here are just like what mitigations are in place, um, systemic things that we can put in place. Oh, can we put a WAF here? Can we put a firewall in front of this? Is there some other mitigation we can do? Um, is there, a, is there a, be a business reason why this shouldn't be prioritized? Uh, and then the biggest lever that you can possibly have um, is saying to a team, okay, you've told me you can't fix this, then you need to go find time with the senior leadership team and tell that to them and get them to agree to it. And typically, just from a scheduling and logistics perspective, like that is practically impossible. Uh, and then from an agreement perspective, like they don't want to do it. So this is a uh, fantastic way to give a little um, security judo to, to put someone else in the position of saying, no, you have to do this, rather than just yourself. So that was all conceptual, right? Let's talk about an actual vulnerability in context and how this would work. And I'm a little pissed off at VMware this week uh, because they're supposed to close with Broadcom on Monday, and that's not happening, maybe? I don't know. Um, so let's talk about VMware. <clears throat> so. Uh, this, this is a good one that came out not too long ago about a remote, a remote attacker being able to trigger an out-of-bound write, right? So in general, it's a, it's a vulnerability that can be exploited anywhere on the internet, uh, doesn't have to be authenticated uh, if your system is attached to it. So let's go through the steps. So by default, right, the default expectation is security patches in seven days. So we tell them, OK, this comes out. This should be patched in seven days. Infrastructure team is busy, can't prioritize it. They've got a normal patch cycle in 90 days. They want to do it then. OK, reasonable ask. So we go to the next step. We talk about risk management. So uh, it's an impact level one, because it's anonymous over the internet. It's a likelihood level three, uh, because the devices are on a protected subnet, let's say. You know, you've got all your vCenter stuff. Uh, on a, a management subnet, it's not directly connected to the internet. You've got some protections around it. You have some mitigations. You can give them some time. So instead of seven days, now it's just a high risk. Now you're down to 30 days. It's even more time for them to do stuff. They still can't do it. They still need more time. So now it becomes a decision for management to make. Is this something that is, uh, it, do we have the resources to do that? Can we accept the risk for that amount of time? Does this make sense for us? Infrastructure needs to spend the effort to get on the SLT schedule, explain the risks to them, and then SLT agreeing or not whether this is something they need to prioritize. And in this case, they do. And at that point, it's out of our hands. Like, our job is to make sure that the decision makers, the senior leadership team, understand the risk of what's going on and for them to help, uh, to help them make decisions. 
And at that point, the decision is a business decision. It's no longer on us as security professionals because we have informed them of what's going on. Um, they are there to take the risks and figure out, you know, is this something that uh, makes sense for us? And no matter if you're talking about ISO 27001, you're talking about um, NIST CSF or uh, SOC 2 or any of these compliance structures, it really boils down to uh, making sure that there's a way for the business to understand the risk of what's in their infrastructure and have the business be able to manage that risk, right? So that's what we're giving them, is we're giving them a tool to manage that risk. We set default expectations, they can't meet that, then we get higher and higher levels of touch until finally we get to a point where they're actually talking to SLT. So, difference. Rather than, so, so what we've done here is rather than setting one set of expectations, now we have a sliding scale of expectations. We have some defaults that if you can meet, perfect. If you can't, we'll, we, can, we can look at it and give you more time if it all makes sense. Uh, the business has an opportunity to decide whether this is a, a worthwhile risk. So it takes it out of the hands of the secu security engineer. It's not just me saying thou shalt patch. It's now SLT saying, no, you're an idiot. You need to go patch this, which is a, a perfect position to be in. Uh, security teams can focus on the high level stuff. So this really allows us to focus on what are the critical high stuff coming out? What are the immediate risks that we have? If we understand and can monitor, if we have Sneak, if we have uh, Orca, Wiz, any of this other stuff, right? we can set these as expectations and then monitor for exceptions. We can see which teams or which vulnerabilities are going beyond that level where we were expecting them to be remediated. Um, so we can identify when they've exceeded those things and do the appropriate hand slapping, um, but still giving them sufficient time and space to be able to fix things. It allows us to focus on the high priority stuff, the things that are high risk that actually matter. Um, and then, yeah, uh, with proper reporting tools, we can hold engineers and teams accountable to the expectations. So we can document dashboard, show them where, where they're not meeting expectations and show that to their management of, we said these things, they're not doing it, and that's it. So uh, things I've learned through this process and, and generally, um, and also, this is, um, this is where I'm at right now in terms of like vulnerability management and trying to do this. Like I said, I've tried to do this a couple of different ways. Um, not all of them have turned out great, uh, but I think I've learned each time along the way and done it a little bit better each time. Um, and this is kind of where I'm at today in terms of how I'm doing it. Um, and absolutely open to and love to hear um, opinions, input, other people's stories. Um, but just a couple of things I've learned um, like I said, I can't secure a bankrupt business, right? The, uh, th that's kind of the underscoring um, line item here is that the business needs to operate. Our job is to make sure that we're reducing, we're reducing risk in a cost-effective manner. We're making sure that we're not going to get hacked, but we're not requiring the business to do such an immense amount of work that it puts them out of business. Um, vulnerability prioritization is a business decision at the end of the day. Um, if the business needs to ship a product so they can keep the doors open, that's, that's the priority, not patching, as much as it's a, a problem, right? Um, in some cases, if you have compliance requirements, if you have like regulatory requirements, it's just something that's actually critical that's gonna bring down the business tomorrow, we can leap forward and become the priority, but in either case, that's a business decision, that's their risk management decision to make. Our job, is to inform and influence. Our job is to make sure they understand what's going on, give them all the details and the context they need, help them understand it and make the decision, and then help them implement it at the end. Um, and let me make uh, uh, so something that's been really good for uh, this specific iteration of vulnerability management I've been doing is setting a good baseline expectation for how systems are supposed to be designed. If every system has a WAF in front of it, if every system has default passwords changed, every system is not open to the internet without X, Y, and Z, then you know by default, okay, these protections are in place. I can give you a little bit more space, a little bit more time to be able to do things. I don't have to be such a, a curmudgeon about making sure patches are up to date when uh, we have this, this longer expectation. Um, 
yeah, I'm sure there's uh, sufficient mitigation so nothing's a fire drill. Um, a WAF or an IPS is great for those zero days that come out, uh, knowing that at the very least you have some monitoring to see if there's something going on. Uh, so you can understand if your vulnerability management and your patching cycles are up to date, if you're actually getting attacked with this stuff is good. Um, and then the, uh, the thing that's worked well for me is making sure that we're, we're setting up vulnerability management as part of the sprint planning cycle. So it's not just, you know, everyone wants to be, everyone wants it to be this continuous process of vulnerability management where it's just an inject into their process every time, right? They get an alert, they go manage it, they do it, which makes sense conceptually. But when you start talking about, I have to plan for this other work, I have to make sure this stuff gets out the door, it really needs to be managed as part of the sprint planning process for engineers. And so being able to get these reports from Orca, from Wiz, from Sneak, from other places, sit down with them and say, okay, here's your stack ranked list of stuff we need, and then we'll manage everything else as an exception is uh, a great way of being able to make that work predictable and allow them to plan for it. Ooh. I think that's it. That's all I got. Like I said, it was a quick one, story time with Nick for 60% of it, and then a little bit of what I'm doing now. Um, this is, uh, this is where, like I said, this is where we're at now. Uh, this is probably gonna change at some point, but this is what I got at the moment. I figured I wanted to share it with y'all and see, get some feedback. And so that's, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Sir. Uh, so if you get like a critical or a high, like how, what's like the life cycle of usually prioritization within your Great question. So the question was, if I'm getting a critical or a high right now, what is the life cycle of that uh, vulnerability? So for me, um, we've got a lot of automation in place to help teams understand like what vulnerabilities are there. It feeds into their sprint planning cycle. For most vulnerabilities, like that's sufficient. They've got their list, they're good, they're happy, it flows in. So we're focusing on, to your point, what are the immediate threats to the business that we need to figure out today? And so we're able to with context, look at what's streaming in and say, okay, this one doesn't matter because you know it's a SSH vulnerability, but we only have port 80 open to the web, so it doesn't really matter that much, right? Uh, so we're able to add context to the critical stuff coming in, downgrade some of the stuff to keep it from being super urgent to them and allow them to keep it in their sprint planning. Um, but when something actually comes in that matters, like we have our alerting set up uh, and our monitoring setup so we get those feeds of criticals and highs coming in. We can do that and then we can go to the teams and push out, hey, listen, here's the deal. Like we don't harsh your mellow most times, but this one matters. So we need you to, to rush it into production. And so um, building up the goodwill of keeping in their sprint planning has given us the slack we need to be able to push the things that matter. And, and it has been a, a really good uh, method of doing it. What about the scenario where you have CVs that are lower in the wild and then they're much higher after your exploitation is set too? It sounds like you're only going in one direction where it happens to be higher via data development more time. You're recontextualizing it slower, of course, just as bad. Good question. So you're you're asking about um, so this works for for lowering the the, the uh, prioritization of vulnerabilities in general but not so much on raising vulnerabilities of, uh, raising the profile of vulnerabilities. Um, so the, the way that we're mitigating that is uh, penetration testing, vulnerability analysis, and just regular review on our part. Um, so when we take a regular look at our environment and see what's going on, um, do some threat modeling to figure out what are the things that we care about, trying to do a good job of just combing through that stuff every so often and grooming it, making sure that there's nothing in there that is uh, something weird uh, that could be weird for our organization. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the downfalls of this is it is designed to do a lot of that, have a lot of downward pressure on it. Um, and then the upward pressure is uh, manual, irregular, uh, and, and has a little bit of time in between it. Um, but that's our, that's our mitigation at the moment is we're, we're doing, regular, doing a good regular process of grooming through that stuff and making sure that we're, we're identifying it. How does this work at scale with like, you know, 10,000 criticals and highs? I'm a little concerned with your model because you're evaluating like, this one. It's a lot of manual work for people in our 
Good question. So he was asking about how does this work at scale? Uh, when you've got a lot of vulnerabilities, it's hard to, because you're doing it one at a time, it's hard to do uh, at scale. Um, good question. Uh, so the, honestly, that's the, that's the part that like, <laughs> you're absolutely right. This is a, a hard thing to do at scale. Um, setting default expectations is the easiest way to, to keep this rolling, right? If you've got a default expectation set that you need to, you need to patch things in a certain amount of time, and you can see where the deviations from that are and be able to, to inform the, uh, the teams about it. Um, it's a really good, um, really good way to keep track of it. Um, thankfully, we don't have a whole lot of, uh, it's a, a pretty small organization that I'm part of, so I'm not uh, needing to do a whole lot of that at the moment. Uh, but that's, I think, going to be my next uh, challenge is how to do this in a larger organization. And I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, on your chart, it said like lows were kind of not a priority. Um, I run a fund cloudy program, and majority of my like things that I'm paying out for, it's like a medium and two lows is what I'm getting popped for all the time. Mm -hmm. So is that like a severity that you're even categorizing kind of a change in this model? Good question. So he's asking about uh, mediums and lows or things that he's getting um, popped on in his bug bounty for a lot. Um, I. Here's, here's the thing, right? I ran the bug bounty program for the New York Times. And one of the things that we did was we uh, took a look at what we were actually getting value from in terms of the vulnerabilities and re-rated re what we wanted to pay out for. Um, and so we redefined, OK, I actually care about these things. Uh, I care about highs. I care about criticals. I care about immediate threats. I care about that kind of stuff. If you want to tell me, if you want to tell me that you can get Donald Trump's tax returns and that counts as PII, like, that's the point of the business. That's what we're doing, right? That's, that's why it exists. Um, and it's technically, you're right. You're getting PII out, but that's, that's inconsequential. Um, so I think it, an important step is making sure you're aligning what you're getting value out of your bug bounty program uh, with what you actually care about. Because um, in these situations, a lot of the lows and mediums we're seeing are not necessarily things that would lead to compromise or lead to, to nefarious actions for us, right? Um, Especially if you're going through that process of doing the re-rating and, and looking at the vulnerabilities, like a lot of them come out to be uh, the SSH server sitting in the closet that isn't connected to the internet, those kind of stuff. Um, and so by focusing on the things that really matter, we get the most return on investment out of the vulnerability management that we have. Uh, and then as we get better at it, we can retweak it and re-identify, OK, maybe now we care about mediums. Maybe now we care about a lower category of things that we can raise up. Um, and, and that, over time, uh, improves the, the security of the company. Yeah. Can you talk with us a little bit about the like, staff digital <coughs> element of it, right? Um, there's some new skills you need to be able to do this. There's you know, probably some people. You probably have to build something out there. What, what did that look like for you? So good question. He's asking about what the staffing looks like to, to build something like this out. Um, so uh, company is about at the moment is pretty pretty small. So let me talk about um, how I've done it in previous companies, um, which are a little bit larger. Uh, I've worked for New York Times, I've worked for Indeed, I've worked for Rackspace, I've worked for other places. Um, the the thing that's worked best, right, is especially in these larger companies, you've got an actual GRC program, um, and in those situations, really what you're providing is you're providing the context for here's how the risk rating should work that the GRC team then goes and implements and manages. And then you're providing the technical knowledge for understanding uh, the context around the vulnerability. So GRC comes to you and says, hey, I've got this thing. What does this actually mean? Your job as an AppSec engineer is to help them understand the context and fit it into that model so that they can then go take that and hand it to the other teams and figure it out. And so uh, there's like two roles here, right? One role is more project management of how do you organize, categorize, talk to teams, track projects, track remediation, do that sort of thing. The other one is more technical. What is this thing? How am I doing this? Like, is, is this a problem? So um, if you're like building this from scratch, I'd say that's two roles. I'd say that's a project manager and an AppSec engineer. If you're building it in a larger context where you already have GRC, I think you're your role as a technical AppSec person then is to make sure they have a process for this, for GRC, and provide the technical context. That's worked pretty well for me in the past, at least. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> so 
Thank you, Nate. All right. Well, like I said, um, always looking to improve, always doing new stuff. Uh, this is the model of kind of what we're doing a little bit at the moment. Um, seems to be working pretty well. Uh, always looking for any advice that you all may have and, and feedback. So welcome it. There's my stuff. Um, and thanks for your time.